The far right is ascendant in Europe, and with it, we are witnessing the return of nationalism. This is a frightening thought for many people, who remember the devastation that nationalist sentiments have wrought upon Europe in the past. But is nationalism necessarily evil? In this video we will go back to examine the history of nationalism, and ask if there are forms of nationalism that can actually be positive, and can help solve the problems that Europe faces today. To find the root of nationalism, we actually need to go back to the Middle Ages. Around the 12th century AD, the Catholic Church developed the idea that Christ had two earthly bodies. One was his physical, human body, and the other was a mystical body, incarnated in the Church. In this mystical body, Christ was the head, the clergy were the vital organs, and the rest was constituted of the regular believers. So the Catholic community started to think of itself as one organic body, a mystical whole in which every person is a little part. The European kingdoms adopted this concept and secularized it, regarding the kingdom as one organic being where the king is the head and his subjects are the body. The kings were still seen as a sovereign over their land, but their subjects were now seen as an extension of them, not just as their subordinates. The land, the patria, also came to be considered as part of that organic being. This blending together of the earthly with the mystical was embodied best of all in the Holy Roman Empire, a body that was both political and religious. So the kingdom, much like the church, gained the mystical dimension, and the king was seen as having two bodies. His body natural, the human body, and the body politique, a mystical being made of the people and the land. The fate of the people thus became mystically connected with the land and the king. If you lost part of the land to an enemy, it was like losing part of yourself. And if you lost the king, it was like losing your head, and you couldn't exist long in such a state. That is why you could never announce that the king is dead. If a king died, the announcement was, the king is dead, long live the king, showing that while the physical king died, the mystical head of the kingdom was still alive, now associated with another physical person. As the Middle Ages ended, this paradigm began to shatter. As the Age of Enlightenment dawned, 17th century philosophers refuted the notion that kings are sovereigns by divine right, or that any man can be sovereign over any other man. Every individual, they said, should be free and equal, sovereign over himself. But in order to maintain their personal safety, individuals come together under a social contract and create a body politique, a society that is governed by the common will. So the idea of the body politique was retained, but without the head. Heads of state were to be merely people that the society appoints to run things, according to the original constitution on which it was formed. When a ruler betrays a social contract, they lose their legitimacy, and the society has the right to replace them. By the end of the 18th century, there were at least two societies formed on the basis of these principles. The United States of America, which broke away from the British monarchy and declared its sovereignty, and France, that got rid of its own monarch, symbolically chopping off his head, and declared the people sovereigns over the state. So, once again, we find the idea that a society is a body, an organic being, but the Enlightenment version had very little of the mystical about it. The body was to be made of three individuals, each with his own identity, and there wasn't much said about the identity of the body politique. And this idea, in the long run, was unsustainable. Anthropologists tell us that a group of people larger than 150 individuals cannot operate as one body, unless they have a shared ethos that binds them together, and the societies that emerged in Europe needed such an ethos. The Romantic movement, which began in the 1790s, provided a solution, as it brought nationalism back into vogue. The term Romanticism indicated that they want to go back to the time of the Holy Roman Empire, to bring back the irrational sides of humanity that were suppressed by the rationality of the Enlightenment thinkers. The Romantics didn't want to go back to being ruled by the church, but they found ways to secularize the old mystical beliefs and make them compatible with the modern state. And so, they went back to the mystical perception of regarding every nation as a body with its own unique identity, an identity that is derived from its history, folklore, customs, language and land. During the 19th century, this idea of nationalism took over most western countries. Even the American society, that didn't have much of a history and a culture to begin with, rapidly developed its own very proud national identity. Note that this nationalism was a liberal concept. Romantic nationalism still maintained the belief in the autonomy of the individual, and many other Enlightenment ideals. Its main goal was liberating the nation from the rule of the monarchs, the church and foreign occupiers, and establishing a nation-state, a state that is molded by the identity of the nation. Nationalism, in the first half of the 19th century, was about freedom and equality, 
reaching its peak in the 1848 Spring of Nations. But gradually, other ideas started to creep in. To illustrate, let's discuss the operas of Richard Wagner, one of the greatest romantic composers, who also dabbled in philosophical and political writing. Wagner started out as a leftist revolutionary who took part in the 1848 uprisings in Germany, and his early writings promote the idea of creating a unified and just society, where the main goal of people is creating art and beauty. He wanted Germany to be the model of such a society, and his operas all draw the thematic material from German mythology and folklore, while expressing his progressive views. But as the years went on and the perfect society failed to materialize, the disillusioned Wagner became more conservative and pessimistic in his views. His last opera, Parsifal, first staged in 1882, shows a society that was contaminated by dark magic and cannot live harmoniously until the contamination is removed. This reflects the idea that started to infiltrate nationalist discourse, and can be found in Wagner's writings as well, that a nation must clean its culture of any foreign elements before it can achieve perfection. The fault that utopia was not achieved, then, started to be blamed on the notion that the mystical body of the nation is contaminated by foreigners. Nationalist thought started to develop the idea that to achieve perfection, the nation had to be purified. This idea was intertwined with another new idea, that came out of biology. Darwinism was all the rage in those years, the new and cool thing, and many thinkers, Wagner included, started to view everything in terms of race. In Parsifal, the contamination is in the blood, and it is the blood that has to be purified for the body to be cured. Nationalist thought became racist, seeking to get rid of mongrels and create a nation of purebred people. Yet another destructive idea that started to be developed was that of national supremacy. At first, as we found in the early writings of Wagner, the idea was that our nation would be a model for other nations on how to achieve perfection. But then, as nations began to talk of themselves as models, they started to believe that they represent the pinnacle of civilization. To be a patriot, it wasn't enough anymore to believe that your national culture is the best for your own nation. You had to claim that it is superior to any other national culture. And from there, it was a short way to the claim that you should impose your model on others. This idea of national supremacy was among the main reasons that led Europe to open two world wars, whereas the notion that culture and race should be purified also led to many atrocities, reaching its apotheosis in the Holocaust. Thus, nationalism became associated with evil things, and in the second half of the 20th century it started to be played down. Believing that nationalism is all bad, Europeans have begun to talk about the world beyond the nation-states, about going back to the Enlightenment ideal of a state that is merely an apparatus to manage the relations between individuals and groups. The prevailing belief is that no culture should be dominant, but all cultures should be equal and the state is merely there to ensure their coexistence. With the establishment of the European Union, the European nation-states began to lose their national identity, and these postmodern ideas took prominence. But there was a snag in this idea of a multicultural utopia. When there is a culture that still sees itself as superior to others, and exploits multiculturalism to advance its supremacist agenda, the absence of the nation-state weakens the ability of the whole society to counter that agenda. This is what is happening in Europe right now with the Muslim cultures, which are allowed to maintain their reported customs instead of being required to make their customs compatible with the norms of the nations they have joined. It turns out that without a dominant culture to show the way, multiculturalism fails. Furthermore, the attack on the idea of a nation-state led to the deterioration of the Enlightenment ideal of the state as well, and we seem to have forgotten that it should be based on a social contract. To quote John Locke, one of the greatest Enlightenment philosophers, foreigners who live all their lives under another government, enjoying the privileges and protection of it, don't automatically come to be subjects or members of that commonwealth. Nothing can make a man a subject except he's actually entering into the commonwealth by positive engagement, an explicit promise and compact. So according to Locke, before immigrants can be made citizens in a society, they must show that they share its ethos. But in today's Europe, Muslims are allowed to become citizens while openly opposing the values of the societies they've joined, and even actively undermining these values. And inevitably, this leads to a backlash in the form of the rise of nationalist European movements, which are often plagued by the bad ideas that attach themselves to nationalism in the past, such as cultural supremacy and racism. So what's the solution? What I propose is going back to the liberal idea of the nation-state. That doesn't mean that you have to give up on the European Union. I think the EU is a good thing, if it is understood as a union between nation-states that does not try to erode the identity. The main thing that differentiates liberal nationalism from more right-wing versions is that it is inclusive, not exclusive. 
Foreign groups that joined the nation should not be seen as defiling its culture, but as enriching it. Immigrant groups should be required to see themselves as part of the nation and adopt its ethos, but to not completely give up on their identity while doing so. Rather, they should find a way to create their own versions of the national identity, and add their own story to the nation's history. In this way, the national identity expands and becomes more diverse, while still growing organically out of its own history and heritage. Nationalism has gone too far at the end of the 19th century, and has brought calamity over Europe in the decades that followed. At the end of the 20th century, Europe has gone too far in the other direction. It is time to swing the pendulum back and find the right balance, before it faces another catastrophe.